you guys, welcome back to Flickers of Fear. So I feel like I'm probably not alone when I say that, in my opinion, Roger Corman's uh, Poe cycle of movies was absolutely the director's finest work. I mean, you know, he made zillions of movies and he always made a profit, but those are my favorite and I kind of feel like most people uh, would agree with that. Now, I had seen almost all of them uh, at one time or another. My favorite is actually Mask of the Red Death, in case you were interested. But for whatever reason, this one that we're talking talking about today had actually like passed me by. Not really sure why I never got around to seeing it. Uh, so of course, I had to rectify this situation as soon as possible. And that's how I ended up watching 1963's The Haunted Palace. And also maybe considering uh, that maybe I have two favorites now in the Corman Poe movie universe. Uh, however, lumping the Haunted Palace in with the Poe movies isn't really entirely fair, even though it usually is considered part of the eight uh, film cycle, uh, because in spite of the name of the movie and a couple lines of dialogue and the fact that the title card reads Edgar Allan Poe's The Haunted Palace, uh, and also they spell Allen wrong with an E instead of an A, which is correct, uh, this is actually not an adaptation of a Poe story. It's actually a loose adaptation of an H.P. Lovecraft novella, The Case of Charles Dexter Ward. So this is almost like a stealth Lovecraft adaptation. Uh, matter of fact, as far as I'm aware, this might have been the first like major film to introduce the Necronomicon, uh, the Cthulhu, Yog Sothoth, like all that kind of stuff, to a mainstream audience. Um, if there was an earlier one, please let me know. But as far as I know, this was the, kind of the first big movie to do that. Now, Roger Corman uh, actually initially intended this to be just like a straightforward Lovecraft film, a Lovecraft adaptation. But uh, to his annoyance, American International Pictures, otherwise known as AI, uh, wanted to tie it in with the Poe adaptations because they'd been so successful. So they actually made him throw in a few lines from Edgar Allan Poe's 1839 poem, which is called The Haunted Palace, and made him give it that name as well. Uh, and that poem actually doesn't really have anything to do with the story. Um, you know, I get why they did it, but, you know, it probably wasn't really all that necessary. It is a good title and it does kind of have something to do i mean there is like a house that's cursed in a cursed village and shit like that so it does kind of like apply but the poem doesn't have anything to do with the movie like i said it's basically like an adaptation of the case of charles dexter ward i mean it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things because i'm gonna say this is an excellent film no matter what story it's based on so so the always amazing vincent price uh plays two roles here actually uh himself and you know one role in like his ancestor, you know what I mean? Uh, there's also a supporting turn by Lon Chaney Jr. And uh, appearances by a couple of Corman regulars, Elisha Cook Jr., he was that he was in everything. Um, I saw on his Wikipedia page, I think that he's actually been in more, uh, I think it was noir films, like, than any other actor. And I was like, huh, what do you know? But yeah, he was in a shit ton of, like, Roger Corman movies, too. And uh, Bruno Vesota, he was also in a bunch. He has a very small role here, but he's always nice to see him. Uh, in addition, this was the actress Deborah Page. I guess it's Page. Uh, this was her final film role. Uh, she had been in, like, a bunch of kind of biblical epics and stuff like that. Uh, she actually retired from acting after this and became a born-again Christian, hosting her own show on the Trinity Broadcasting Network, which I can't say that I've ever seen. Now, I have to give a special mention here of the sets and, like, the matte paintings in this movie, which are all, like, completely lush and gorgeous. Uh, the inside of the Haunted Palace, you know, the titular palace, in fact, is actually even more impressive than it appears because... Um, I actually found out that it was actually much smaller than it looks on screen. Roger Corman actually used all of these kind of, uh, you know, film tricks, like shooting things in forced perspective to make it look gigantic. And the effect is flawless. Like, I would never have known that if I hadn't looked it up. It looks like an enormous, enormous castle. So our story begins in 1765 in the small village of Arkham. Like I said, this is a Lovecraft story. Uh, the townsfolk are very suspicious of the man who lives in the palace on the hill, whose name is Joseph Kerwin, uh, who's played by Vincent Price, obviously. They actually suspect him of being in league with the devil. 
So one night, they follow this seemingly bewitched young woman as she kind of like walks all dazed and shit like through the streets and up toward the palace. When she gets there, uh, Kerwin and his mistress, Hester Tillinghast, who he actually like stole from one of the other like uh, townsfolk, so they're not real happy about that. They chain this girl up in the basement and look like they're getting ready to sacrifice her. Like you find out later, that's not exactly what's happening, but it, that looks like what they're what they're gonna do. But uh, one thing and another, the villagers eventually end up busting in and drag Kerwin out uh, and tie him to a tree and set his ass on fire. So before he dies, he curses the whole town, as you do, uh, as well as, like, the future generations of its residents. You know what I mean? Just, like, you know, like, curse you and your children and your children's children and et cetera, et cetera. So 110 years later, a man named Charles Dexter Ward, also Vincent Price, uh, and his wife, Anne, show up in Arkham to have a look at a property that they have inherited from Ward's great-great-grandfather, who, of course, was Joseph Kerwin. Now, obviously, it's gone through the family. They don't really go into, like, who owned it before that. They said no one's lived there for 100 years. So I'm assuming it just went through the family line, and everybody's like, fuck it, I'm not living there. But, you know what I mean? So he ends up with it, and he's never even been there. So he goes into, like, he's looking for directions, and he goes in the tavern in town, which is called the Burn man so but then like mr and mrs ward get a whole room full of stink eye like from all the denizens of the town who believe that charles ward is joseph Kerwin, like returned or resurrected mostly because he looks uncannily similar to the old warlock uh, as he's pictured in this like kind of portrait that hangs in the palace like they all like remember what he looks like so all of the people in the town too are like uh you know the descendants of people that lived there before that burned him alive, you know what I mean? So although the Archimites, if you want to call them that, uh, um, do their best to discourage the wards from, you know, they just basically want them to fuck off, uh, the town doctor named Dr. Willett, who's played by Frank Maxwell, he isn't superstitious at all, and he thinks all of this kind of cursed stuff is a bunch of hooey, so he actually kindly helps the couple find the palace, which... To be fair, is kind of like hard to miss. I mean, it's just kind of like, here's the little village down here and here's this big, huge, like looming castle like over the town. I'm like, it's right there, uh, obviously. Uh, so Ward is basically like, well, I don't think we'll be staying here in Arkham, especially since everybody's being so fucking rude to us. But I mean, him and his wife at least kind of want to take a little bit of a gander at the house they inherited before they decide what they're going to do with it. Like maybe they're going to sell it or something like that. Before they get up there, though, uh, they actually catch a glimpse of a little girl without any eyes uh, kind of being herded along the main street by her mother, which is, you know, a little bit disquieting, to say the least. I mean, the whole town is pretty weird, like, to be honest. Uh, I mean, obviously, everyone's, like, really rude to them and shit like that, but... You also see kind of glimpses of this, like one of the town elders, Edgar Whedon, he's um, actually shown feeding some raw meat to something, someone locked behind a door in his house. And uh, also one time, like when the wards go into the village and they're walking down the main street, this whole bevy of like other mutated people, like some of them don't have any eyes, some of them don't have like an eye and a mouth and they're all like fucked up looking. And they kind of like come skulking out from various places and like surround them, but they don't say anything or like touch them or anything. They just kind of stand there and like look menacing. So they're like, hmm, that's a little strange. So when they get to the house, uh, the wards actually end up crossing paths with the very seemingly friendly Simon, who's played by Lon Chaney Jr. He's like the caretaker. But it doesn't take too long before Anne is creeped out by the old place and it's like, let's get the fuck out of here. I don't like it. Charles agrees that the house is really spooky. He actually calls it a mausoleum. But by the time they got up there and everything, you know, it's fucking 1800. So they had to take a carriage and whatnot. So they're like, look, it's like too late to, you know, go back and go sleep somewhere else now. So we might as well stay the night here because the caretaker laid out a room for them. And it's like, then we'll just sort everything out in the morning. We're probably not going to stay here. Problem is, though, that the malevolent looking painting painting of Joseph Kerwin over the mantle seems to have other ideas. Uh, it actually appears that it's imbued with the spirit of Joseph Kerwin, who was a warlock, 
And as Charles stares at it, like almost he gets kind of hypnotized by it, his ancestor is actually able to take over more and more of his personality or his soul or whatever you want to call it. Um, now, Charles is very strong-willed, so he's able to fight back against the invasion. And so he does act normal sometimes, like he goes like in and out. Uh, but slowly, though, over the course of the story, Kerwin starts to take possession of his great-great-grandson, and he vows that with this new body, it's like, oh, this time it works. Like, you're led to believe that he's been trying it before, like he tried to possess other people, it didn't work out so good. But he's like, oh, I got an ancestor this time, so it's so it totally worked. And so he wants to finish the task that he started, like, more than a century ago, which was essentially using the Necronomicon to summon the Elder Gods and mating them with human women. Remember how I said they? it seemed like they were going to sacrifice that girl? That wasn't what they were going to do. <laughs> so, yeah, the implication is a little alarming. Uh, so, yeah, so he wants to mate the gods with human women so that he can create a, a race of super beings. It just seems like everybody wants to do that, don't they? Sure. Now, in this endeavor, Kerwin is actually aided by his faithful servant, Simon, who I mentioned earlier, and another guy named Jabez. Now, both of these guys, they're either immortal or I'm guessing maybe they also have possessed their own ancestors just like he did. Um, I, that makes more sense now that I'm thinking about it. They don't really explain it. And he even manages to resurrect his mistress, Hester, by digging up her corpse. At first, they don't think it's going to work because they're like Ooh, she's way too far gone <laughs> like she's real fucked up looking uh so i think the couple the first couple times they do it it fails but they do some lovecraft magic on it and eventually she's back to her uh living hot self again uh, so this little villain squad here uh, then goes around killing some of the townspeople like in revenge for the whole burning alive thing. Then it turns out that like Anne, Charles's wife, and Dr. Willett, who was like the only sympathetic townsperson, uh, they apparently save the day. Though the ending of this makes it pretty clear that Kerwin has not really been defeated. So there's that. So as I mentioned, this is a really fun flick. I enjoyed this very, very much. Uh, it's absolutely one of the best Corman films of this era. Uh, Vincent Price was incredible as always, um, playing both the very wicked Joseph Kerwin and, you know, the nice guy, but also like tormented uh, Charles Ward character. Like he, and he did like a really good job. Uh, story moved along at a good pace. It was never boring. Had an awesome, awesome set design. I just loved the interior of that castle and just had this real cool like gothic feel to it uh special effects gotta say on the elder gods were uh, you know you could tell that they were uh pretty obviously hampered a bit uh by the minuscule budget but you know Ro it's roger corman uh he was smart enough to kind of keep the shots of the monsters like pretty brief uh you know and kind of ambiguous and kind of focused mainly on just like the lavish interiors the nice costumes and this the whole like chilling atmosphere which it's more in line with like you know poe's work and lovecraft's work anyway they were more atmosphere guys and that really comes across here. I mean, it's not a super, super faithful adaptation of Lovecraft's novella, but I think it has enough elements from the original story to please kind of like Lovecraft purists, maybe. And I think it actually captures the spirit of Lovecraft's work like really, really well. Um, so if you've seen Corman's Poe pictures, I feel like a lot of people have seen those, um, and you want to see something just as good as that, but Lovecraft, um, then definitely check this one out. I kind of feel like this one doesn't get talked about as much as maybe some of the other Poe ones, but it's absolutely worth your time. I really, really liked it a lot. And let me know what you thought about it in the comments if you've seen it. Did you even know that this was a Lovecraft adaptation? Because uh, I certainly didn't. I just thought it was another, like, a, another Poe one, but it's not. So uh, yeah, if you haven't seen it check it out i actually watched it on amazon prime uh it's on there for free but i'm sure you can stream it elsewhere uh if you would like to so again let me know what you thought about it in the comments and that'll do it for this flickers of fear i'll see you guys again on the next one bye